Charles Altendorf here, and I'd like to announce my official return to the Know Your Place podcast after a long hiatus. This will be episode 63, and on this episode we'll be discussing Kanzuk and Brexit from an American perspective, as well as discussing sort of the future plan for the show. Stay tuned. And hello, everyone. Uh, we're back here at the Know Your Place podcast, and I'm Charles Altendorf. And uh, yeah, it's uh, great to be back. It's been a few months. I just uh, got too busy with my schedule uh, to continue making weekly episodes. I believe I, um, man, what all has happened? I've had a second kid. I think I, that happened before I went on hiatus, but uh, I had a second kid. Had a lot of, uh, got elected to the Mapping Professionals Board here in Kentucky, and a lot of other things went down. So I was just too busy to keep recording, and uh, I think I've decided in the future I'm going to be going to a monthly format, which will give me more time to produce the shows better, and, uh, well, produce the shows better. Just mainly, uh, that's all I can really spare for this endeavor, although it is still a lot of fun. And I've really appreciated all the interesting people I've met along the way. And uh, that's actually where I wanted to get to to start here. I'd like to thank Scott Strauss and Malik. Uh, gosh, Malik, I'm going to butcher your last name, so I won't do it. Uh, but they sort of encouraged me to get back on the horse again and have provided me with ideas and things. So I wanted to shout out and say this is a personal dedication to both of them. And so we'll uh, jump into our topic at hand here. So on this week's episode, I was really uh, kind of stunned, stunned that um, Scott had personally asked me to record an episode about Brexit and Kanzuk from an American perspective. Now, uh, the reason why I was a little bit shocked that he wanted me to do this is because... Uh, well, I guess I briefly touched around the surfaces of Brexit on several different episodes, and I haven't really covered the Kanzuk topic yet that much, I don't think. But, um, you know, I almost kind of feel like it's not my place as an American to talk about either of these topics. You know, these are very personal topics for the British and the Canadian, Australian, and New Zealander people. But... Uh, I And I also feel like, there is there really any way for me to be informed enough to go on about these subjects? You know, I listen to a lot of media out of England, the BBC, LBC, um, our, uh, what's the Irish one called? I listen to the Irish one too, uh, RTE, that's it. And I have, for, at different points, listened to some CBC and read some articles that I actually watched a few things from the Rebel Media Network, but that's kind of uh, that's uh, we we won't go there about the reliability of that network. Uh, so uh, yeah, I mean, um, I I do know about the topics, but I've always felt like people would just say, you know, you're an American, so you have no right to have an opinion on it. So Scott, thanks for the nod, and I'll sort of get into it a little more here and quit waxing on about all of my uh, platitudes. Uh, so, what is interesting for me from an outside perspective from the jump, especially the American perspective, is um, I kind of grew up, and this is, I hope this doesn't sound too arrogant, I'm, I'm trying not to sound very American exceptionalist here. Uh, you know, I do love a lot of things about America, but there are also things I don't like about America, but I also don't really see myself living anywhere else besides America either. So, uh, but what, what I mean by that is when I come from this perspective, you have to understand that for me growing up, especially in the, when we were in the 90s and early 2000s, and it's still relatively true today, but it may not be quite as true. And now with this coronavirus thing happening, who knows how much more true it is. But I grew up sort of not really worrying about our trade deals. Or not really worrying about um, 
other countries and this sounds crazy right because yes obviously we have nafta and there's a lot of people that are mad about how much we've dealt with the uh beijing government in china you know but at the end of the day i've always sort of been uh somewhat confident that if there was a trouble between us and another country or whatever we could make the stuff here and we wouldn't need other countries that being said uh this coronavirus epidemic has really tested the limit of that theory uh but we still we found a way to do a lot of things and that's the way it's always been in america i feel like there's always been a sort of base of things that are made here and you can ma get made here relatively easy so why why is that important that i'm saying that well um i'm not trying to say that that's not possible other places but it's just not being done other places and that's where this whole this is where the brexit thing really becomes interesting and crucial in my opinion so if we're looking at a pure numerical um statistic if we're looking at the pure uh <clears throat> statistics of uh sort of size of economy rankings right which you know obviously i'm in america so uh there's a little debate about whether or not china is bigger than us i think a lot of people think that they fake their numbers and they're not but regardless, we're one or two, right? When we come and knock in, nobody really turns us away. There's no issues we really have, right? Um, but if you look at the UK, it's the sixth largest economy in the world. And it's part. it was part of the EU, which was, uh, which was about, uh, if, it's ab if the UK is about 2.7 trillion and the EU is about 18 trillion, you can see, you know, sort of where it falls in there with that. But, um, so the UK is the sixth largest, and Canada is the tenth, Australia is the fourteenth, and New Zealand's, like, so far down there, I could, I, I didn't even look at where the ranking was, right? Uh, but, uh, so the, um, the issue we have here is that, uh, the UK, when it was at its peak of the colonial area, era, obviously, it was number one by far, like we are now in America. Uh, well, I guess we're not quite as much. De again, depends on what we really believe the Beijing government's numbers on, which I don't believe any of their numbers, just to put that out there. So the UK, uh, it, it's no longer at, uh, it's no longer controlling its own destiny. You know, and I don't think you can really argue, you can argue that point. You can argue how it's gotten to that point, but you, I don't think you can really argue that it doesn't control its own destiny in economics. Uh, so why is this a, well, if you're somebody from Britain, like my friend Scott, I mean, that's kind of problematic, right? Like, you know, you, they're at the, especially when you joined a trading relationship in the European Union that was supposed to make your country stronger together. But if you sort of, in the way I analyze it, as somebody who's grown up in America, and actually I grew up rather sympathetic to German-American culture or Germany, uh, I, basically it kind of does. I, I, I want to hesitate to say, um, to come out here and say Fourth Reich stuff because that's a little, that's a little intense to say that. But it looks like basically the EU has been a negative deal for England at the or for the UK and propped up Germany and France. Uh, so why do I say this? Well, back in the day, uh, the way I understand the British economy really working at its peak was, uh, you know, the main breadth of manufacturing was taking place in the UK. And the main amount of banking was coming out and money invested in more manufacturing. And the materials were being gathered and collected in all the other colonial uh, outfits and brought in to um, the UK and then dispersed back out as product, right? And advancing uh, all these civilizations that you could argue weren't as industrialized as the UK. And that's where the UK was making boatloads of money. I mean, just insane money that I think even if we, I think if we were to factor it with inflation, it would be more than American money right now. I mean, it was an insane amount of money. So what happened here is that, you know, obviously 
in the post World War era, the UK began to uh, pull out of these colonies, right, due to various pressures in all of these colonies. And, you know, in some ways it's not really been too much of a problem because the UK is still very dominant in the banking sector and still does a lot of the investing in these former colonies. But it it lost its manufacturing base. It had, it, and you know, yes, I understand there's still some manufacturing happening in the UK, but I even looked it up because I was curious where it ranked in manufacturing, and it's it's all the way down to, um, where is it here? I found the number. It's all the way down to ninth. It's almost fallen out of the top ten in manufacturing, and that's kind of insane to think about when it used to be by far number one for a while. And um, so if you're if you're a British person, you know, and you look at your past, how can you not look at it, at least for, as I see it as an American, how can you not look at it and say, well, we're really getting hosed for Germany here because uh, and not just Germany, but, uh, you know, the whole EU, right, because you're in this deal that was supposed to uh, be the counteraction, if you will, to giving up your colony apparatus due to various political pressures and other things and it's and instead the manufacturing base has pretty much moved out of the UK into you know Asia and Germany so uh you know and much other parts of eastern europe as well so now what's going on in the UK is instead of controlling your own destiny and making lots of your own products, they're getting completely undercut by German and Asian products. And, you know, it wouldn't, it's not necessarily a problem to import things, but it is a problem when it becomes that far out of balance that you, you have no base to control your own stuff from. And I, uh, so that's the way I sort of see it, right? So, yes, you can make the argument the UK by uh, choosing to have done a Brexit and leaving the, uh, you know, the largest quote-unquote trading bloc in the world that uh, it's dropping off a significant amount of size. In fact, if it were to, if the Kansas thing goes through and becomes a reality, even if you b combine Canada, Australia, and New Zealand back into the fold, and it's like a completely free market between those countries, um, you know, that will only be a third of the size of the EU's trading bloc. But there's something that I think uh, the opponents of a Kansas partnership are really not considering. And that is that, again, the UK could bring back sort of part of what made it strong and made its colonies strong, which is uh, restarting that cycle of bringing in the raw materials, manufacturing them into products in the UK, and pushing them back out to its colonies. And, or in this case, Canada, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Because uh, when you look at uh, manufacturing for the other countries, Canada is 13th on that list, and it's uh, about half of the UK's output right now. And Australia, uh, is, was the, Australia and New Zealand don't even crack the top 30. So uh, that is what I think uh, the UK could really capitalize from. And all the countries would benefit because right now you're seeing a, str a real strain happening to Australia and New Zealand because of uh, sort of China. You know, they're trying to come into their market and undercut their stuff, and they've taken over some of these products that used to be from the UK, but they're, you know, they're providing shoddy products, and, you know, they're trying to exert political will over them in a way that I don't think the UK really would. So, uh, and they're not culturally the same. I mean, even though there is um, a growing Asian population in both countries, it's still not culturally the same to be, you know, part of the Beijing get the Beijing government versus the London government. Uh so yeah, I uh I uh as an outsider, I see Kanzuk and Brexit as positive moves for the UK. I think that uh the UK will by doing that, you uh you gain not only uh places to extract resources from, but to push stuff back out too. And furthermore, you can take it a step further and help your 
you know, I don't know exactly how bad. I The homeless problem did sound kind of bad to me based upon what I was listening to with the UK. But, um, you know, sort of the overcrowding problem in some of the UK's urban centers. I mean, we're talking about taking this to a complete throwback, and I'm sure some people are going to be against that and hate me for it and write it in the comments section. But, uh, you know, then you sort of, if you have a problem with the urban centers again, we, there's still some open land in Canada and Australia. Now, granted, it's, it's a lot tougher to have it land, but I've always believed that humans will find a way to live somewhere. Uh, you know, you look at America, for example, our fourth largest city uh, Phoenix is in the middle of the desert. I mean, it could be done, okay? You know, and I I believe the British people are plenty ingenuitous enough to find ways to start colonizing more, or, you know, start developing more of the land in Canada and Australia and even New Zealand. So, yeah, that's what I think. I think Kansuk is a really good idea, and I know in the beginning it's not going to look quite as good as it should, but I think there's a lot of potential for long-term growth there if the UK really uh, invests in it and Australia, New Zealand, and Canada get on board. Now, that being said, Canada is the one wild card in this equation, right? I think Australia and New Zealand, to a large degree, already feel part of a Kanzuk with the UK. And, you know, they love each other, and, you know, it's a, it'd be a plenty fine uh, arrangement. But... Canada, I don't know what to say about you. You know, I um, I want to love you and respect you as an American because you are our neighbors. We have no beef with each other, uh, really. But you, you also, your leadership has been, in my opinion, kind of economically unstable in the past couple decades. I mean, yes, yes, absolutely. I have bought some Canadian-made products. Um, their lumber's actually halfway decent. Bought in some shelves. You know, I buy maple syrup sometimes. Uh, I'm trying to think what else I've gotten from Canada. I've gotten a few things from Canada. But largely, you know, I, I get American or, you know, I get a lot more Mexican stuff and I get Japanese stuff. And I don't really mind. I, I have no problem with helping out the Mexican economy, as I've said before in other episodes. But Canada is the tricky thing in this equation. Yes, I uh, they I understand that it still kind of seems like any type of movement in Canada to be more culturally not British it seems like a a rogue minority or only a majority in Quebec. But uh, you know they just seem to really uh, be kind of hot want to keep their options open, which is okay. But then. The, they do they do things that are really strange like uh, and I know I bring this up a lot but when we made NAFTA 2.0 I remember right all before the build up Trudeau and all of his cabinet members were throwing all the shade at us here in America and this and that and whatever and pretty much our president just and his team just decided hey we're just gonna sign with Mexico and to heck with you guys and sure enough in the last 11th hour, Trudeau comes beating down our door to get in on it. So, uh, yeah, I think that Canada needs to make up its mind what it wants. Canada, you know, I think it likes to think it has more economic autonomy than it really does. And personally, I think they would be suited by being part of a Kansas arrangement. Uh, and I, you know, I'm glad they're part of NAFTA, but... I, I honestly don't see what they really gain from being part of NAFTA with us. You know, I see how it works well for us in Mexico, and it's I think it's been beneficial to both countries. But I, Canada just seems like they're just in there buying our stuff, and they're getting a negative deal out of it. So anyway, that's my thoughts on it all. Uh, let me know what you all think. Uh, I'm sure I'll get a bunch of hate mail from Canadians and uh, other people who were anti-Brexit. But uh, there you go. That's what I think. Thanks. Bye. Check out the Know Your Place podcast on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash knowyourplacepodcast, all one word, or on Facebook at facebook.com slash knowyourplacepodcast, all one word. 
and we will be coming soon to YouTube and iTunes, and maybe another social media platform near you. Special thanks to my wife, Sarah, and Jay Graff for the riff. <laughs>